please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Well, you're looking at a really bad screen if you're a bull because uh, the market's down quite a bit. And it's not just that the, the market's down and that can happen. It's profile of stocks. As we discussed, the biggest loser today is Bajaj Finance down 8.5%. Uh, the mighty Bajaj Finance, of course. Uh, there are others as well. Advanced decline at about 1 is to 5. And financials, there's clearly a bit of a problem. Even DHFL, by the way, is now trading at the low of the day. I mean, it, it's still up about 15, 16%. But it opened here and now it's broken that mark. Uh, 11 a.m. is also the time where the margin pain issues are important. So that would be the other point that would be important. Uh, about uh, 45 minutes left for that. Uh, joining us now is a veteran India watcher, uh, Jonathan Sheezal of Ashburton, who manages the Ashburton India Equity Opportunity and the China India Equity, Equity Fund is with us. Uh, Jonathan, good morning. Thanks a lot for joining us. Good to see you in our studios. We normally talk to you over Skype. So for, good to talk to you. But you have been watching India for long now. There's a bit of a panic going on about a debt market, <coughs> about money market. Your thoughts on what's happening right now? Yeah, I mean, you know, clearly it's liquidity squeeze. I think uh, that's something that's globally impacting market as money is becoming more expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, to us, the underlying economy still is improving here. Um, you just get these panics from time to time, uh, creates volatility and opportunity for long-term investors. But yeah, clearly at the time, it is uh, somewhat worrying. Okay. Would you buy right away? That's always very difficult, isn't it? Um, we, I mean, at the end of the day, you, you look at counters, you look at stocks um, and individual stocks. If they're trading at what you consider is good value, um, then then we do start to, to, to you know increase positions. In markets like this, we wouldn't tend to do an entire unit size, for example, in one go. We we just take bite-sized chunks okay. uh, and do it. Like Jonathan, hi, good morning. First of all, what brings you to India? Are you here on holiday or on uh, business? Work. <laughs> no, so, um, no, just seeing a few companies. Um, you know, it's, it's a good time to come. I always quite like to come this time of year. Not too many foreign investors over here just yet. Um, mm -hmm. And companies, obviously, you know, we can speak to everybody. So, and and not have too you hot. had any of those meetings yet? I mean, what have, the, what have the takeaways been in terms of demand trends, just general sentiment? And before that, what kind of companies are you meeting? If you can reveal names or at least sectors. Um, I, I've just arrived yesterday, so I haven't okay. had any meetings uh, <laughs> just, just yet. Um, I mean, today, for example, I'm, I'm seeing uh, existing holdings, uh, some existing holdings. Godridge Agravet is a, a name we've had since IPO, uh, or oh, sorry, since it was delisted from, from the parent. Um, I'm also seeing Future Consumer, um, it's a new position that we, we have as well today. And then I'm seeing um, um, Oberoi Realty as well. Um, yeah. The real estate sector I think is an interesting area, um, it's one we haven't got much exposure in, so that's another area we're looking at. Okay. So uh, since you are, you know, I I'll come back to the consumer space since you have an exposure mm -hmm. there, but you have uh, generally stayed away from NBFCs, uh, you don't have too many of them in your portfolio. Um, what what have you made of the recent crisis that we've seen, or at least the so-called crisis in the NBFC space? Is this a good opportunity to buy, or would you sort of stay away from this space entirely? Yeah, so we've tried to, in our portfolio, you know, I think looking at, you know, the cost of money is going up mm. at the end of the day, everywhere across the world. Mm. So clearly how companies <coughs> access money, they're all growing strongly. You know, there's, there's huge opportunities over here for growth. That's not the issue. The issue is obviously the price of money mm -hmm. and how you access that money. Um, so that's one of the reasons we prefer to stay at banks with good liability franchises that, that you know, can, can get that money or cheaper, hold a cheaper money from, from deposits. Um, some of the MBFCs we have played in the past, uh, they did get quite expensive, I guess, towards the beginning of the year or in, and last year. Um, so we did exit a couple of positions then, um, but, yeah, but more recently we would rather just focus on the banks. But I, but I think clearly, you know, what's going on in the MBFC space today, you could argue is a consequence of, of the increasing cost of capital yes, and, and the, the, the wobble through that, that will come from that. Okay, uh, which that's part of the finance, sorry, just to complete this, which part of the finance uh, universe, you know, give insurance, wealth managers, brokerages and banks, corporate banks, PSU, public sector banks, uh, retail lenders, which will you first be attracted to? What's your picking on? So it's been interesting that the corporate banks have uh, went on a quite a substantial re-rating over the last three or four months since, since the last quarterly numbers. Yes. And the private sector guys all sort of derating. Uh, we used that opportunity, you know, I, I get, we, we were quite heavily into corporate banks for quite some time, and that was quite a painful trade. Mm -hmm. uh, we stuck away from the private sector banks because we found valuations a bit, a bit, a bit punchy, shall we say. 
But obviously the growth we believe is there, so, but actually we have used this opportunity to um, initiate a position in HDFC Bank, which okay. I guess everybody owns. <laughs> yeah. We didn't. Um, you know, I think the opportunity for the private sector banks is still massive. Um, when you look at the PSU space, you know, yeah. can they lend? Do they have an appetite to lend and, 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 and defend market share? So yeah. I think the private player is still uh, the area to, to, to focus on. Okay. The <coughs> other stock which has done remarkably well uh, for you is Infosys. Uh, mm. uh, your thoughts on this IT rally? Because it's you know, now we're talking about currency depreciation, but that's been a bit of a tailwind. The rally started uh, way back last year. Uh, uh, you know, just just your your thoughts on what's going so right for the Indian IT sector right now? Yeah, it's. I mean, clearly the the underlying demand situation of the business has improved. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, last year when we were actually adding to these positions, um, you know, obviously there was some doubt about that, and obviously the Trump issue was was at the fore last year for for this sector. Um, the, so we felt there was quite a lot of fear in stock prices then, and, and, and we were adding into you know stock prices when they're roughly one standard deviation below their the long term mean. You sort of fast forward to today, um, and now the v you haven't got value on your side, I guess you could argue. They're not screamingly expensive, but certainly the IT sector is not cheap anymore. Mm. Mm. Um, and it's become a bit overloved, and, and this whole rupee argument, um, yes, obviously there is some benefit to the IT stocks from a weak rupee, but as we all know, they give the margin to the client. Mm. Um, and it's not as if the competition doesn't have Indian operations as well. So. I'm not quite so. If I'm honest, we've been cutting some of our positions, just looking in a little bit of profit in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, okay. Generally, if you, I mean, to move out uh, and look at uh, your country, your pecking order, uh, do you think EMs will still be in trouble? Uh, EM currencies. Are you at the moment looking to buy China and India? So I, I think it, it's it's fascinating at the moment. Um, obviously, all EMs are getting tarred, you mm. know, with with, with with a strong dollar brush. Um, and, and obviously, the, the continuing trade issues are having a you know, particular mm -hmm. impact on China-related emerging markets. I think India clearly has stood out mm -hmm. since March, April time, when India started outperforming because of the, the yeah. whole um, trade issues. So India still does stand out from that perspective. Uh, but certainly, I think if you look at individual fundamentals and macro fundamentals of each, in, you know, each emerging market, um, I think a lot of emerging markets are a lot better positioned today than they were, for example, a few years back with the taper tantrum um, and the fragile five as yes. such. So, you know, to us, I think it's been some, some of the market reaction is somewhat unfair, but it's just how it is. Um, you know, mm. people don't tend to look at fundamentals too much when there's a bit more panic going on. Okay, coming back to the earlier point, you did mention you're meeting some of the consumption companies here, you know, Goodrich, Agrovid, Future Consumers. How are you looking at this space? Uh, this is a space that you've relatively liked in the past, but some of these stocks like Future Consumers have sort of fallen more than 40% this year. Is it a good time to be buying uh, these franchises? Yeah, there's a massive disparity in performance of, of, of particularly staple stocks, if, for example. So we, we've always stayed away from staples for, for some time, and it, I guess it's been the wrong call because they've carried on re -rating. To, to valuation points, which I just find unbelievable, quite frankly. Um, clearly, uh, there is a, a fantastic consumption story in this country, and it has many decades to run. Mm -hmm. But it's the price you're willing to pay yeah. um, that, yeah. that, that's the issue for us. And, and some, something like future consumer is a disruptor in the space. If you look at valuations of most staple stocks today, and you look at the growth rates that are implied in them, to me, that, that's not factoring in anything or any risk of, of a consumption of a change in consumption mm. patterns. Okay, uh, you know, just a, a final question from my side. Uh, you know, in your China India fund, you've been a bit more overweight on India. But you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, as we head towards the election season, uh, uh, and there's going to be some volatility, is it time to take some money off India and put it in China? I mean, is, is that how you'll approach, or will well, you put more I, money? Well, I guess India? you know that in China has its own issues. I mean, clearly okay. China has been slowing down. Um, but, but obviously, with what's going on from a trade perspective, I think we're seeing some stimulus coming through now. Now, I don't think at the moment they're going to do a full-blown stimulus package like we've seen sometimes in the past. But certainly what you have in China that you don't have in India is value. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, Chinese shares yeah. have really been hit hard. So from that perspective, I think some people, you know, you've had quite a few investors who have been reducing Indian positions. Foreign investors 
um, ownership of India is at sort of 2011 levels. You know, this market has not been held up or driven by foreign investors, exactly. it's domestics. <coughs> um, so I think foreign investors probably, ha you know, there is a preference for China over India as well. And, and of course, what's been leading the market over the last couple of years, it's been the the e-commerce plays, the ten cents, the Alibabas, which India doesn't have. Mm. So I think probably for the time, yeah, I would agree that we'll probably be nudging up China vis-a-vis -vis India in the short okay. term. Jonathan, we're out of time today, but uh, of course we will continue speaking with you, and it's a pleasure for us, a privilege for us, that you dropped in in our studios. Thank you very much for joining us today. All right, uh, so that's a veteran watcher saying that, yes, uh, uh, valuations are falling, but India is an expensive market. We have to get back to the debt market tangle because it's tangling the equities, almost uh, strangling the equity markets. For a check on the latest uh, ground situation, Sunil Subramanian, Managing Director and CEO of Sundara Mutual Fund and Prabodh Agarwal, Group CFO of IIFL, in a minute. Okay, they are already with us, so we'll go over to them. Uh, well, first up to you, uh, uh, Sunil. What's the situation on the ground? Um, uh, have there been any uh, redemption requests at your desk? But more importantly, what is your industry telling you? Uh, are people calmed by the regulators' uh, uh, press release or are they still coming for money? No, I think at, at our counters we are not facing any redemption pressures okay. and from what we hear from the industry, I don't think there is any sense of panic. Mm. Yes, uh, you know, because if you look at the industry where it's raised the money, right? A mm. significant portion of that is in FMPs. Mm. And about a few years ago, SEBI changed the rule, saying that FMPs, you cannot take out money before. Mm. Whereas a few years ago, during the previous crisis, uh, you could pay an exit load and take money out of FMPs too. So at that time, there was a sense of panic in 2013 because a lot of people were willing to pay the exit load and get out of these uh, long-term holdings. But today on FMPs, you have to wait till maturity and a significant portion of uh, credit risk has been taken in these buy and hold kind of uh, papers. So I think that's uh, uh, that sees the burden. That being said, you know, uh, at Sundaram, we don't have a medium-term credit fund. So all up, 95 percent of our portfolio is in AAA uh, rated uh, securities. Mm. So. Uh, uh, in that sense, you know, we don't have a medium-term credit accrual fund where uh, investors could be taking this call. But our sense of talking to the industry is that there is not yet a panic situation. I think the, the uh, uh, RBI and uh, SEBI's uh, efforts have actually played a very laudatory role. Okay, Prabodh Agarwal, the group CFO of IFL is also with us. Prabodh, would you concur that, uh, you know, it's not a time to panic? And what are you seeing in terms of any kind of redemption pressures? Yeah, so, of course, you know, I would agree that uh, it's not a time for panicking. Uh, and, of course, you know, uh, it has been triggered off by certain, uh, you know, events at, uh, at the corporate level. But uh, it's good that the regulators, the RBI, came in and uh, made a press release that, you know, they would step in and avoid any kind of a liquidity crisis. See, we at IFL Group, we are very comfortable with the liquidity situation. We had actually planned to redeem close to 2,800 crores of CP in the last week of September, and we are planning to go ahead to, with, uh, with, with that redemption, you know, despite all the liquidity scare and all that. We mm -hmm. have enough uh, lines of credit which we have planned, which will be drawn down in this week, and that will be used to repay all the CP. Mm -hmm. So we are confident that, you know, that we'll be able to repay and then uh, raise fresh CP as and when required in the next quarter. Mm. No, that is the point, the raising of the fresh CP. Now, let me read out some numbers which Credit Suisse has just put out. Uh, for NBFCs, uh, uh, you know, in the past one year, the share of non-bank funds has risen to 74%. Most of this came from mutual funds. And mutual funds as a whole, their NBFC exposure has increased three times since 2016, March 2016 to current day. The mutual fund NBFC exposure has increased three times. Now, Sunil, will there be a move to cap NBFC exposure on the part of the mutual fund industry simply for safety to diversify? I think uh, SEBI already has in place, I think there's a 30% cap on each sector. They allowed a 10% extra for the housing finance sector. Okay. So I think there is a prudent cap in place. The reason you're seeing this increase is because manufacturing cycle hasn't picked up in India. So there are not enough manufacturing companies issuing paper, one. 
So NBFCs are naturally because retail consumption is growing and retail finance is growing. They have felt the need for funds and hence they have come to mutual funds to raise. So I'm saying this is a natural market uh, uh, phenomenon which has happened and I think there are enough checks and balances which SEBI has put in to curb sector-wise, sector-specific exposures. So I don't think again that there's any need to overreact and cap anything right now. Okay. Uh, uh, Prabhu, the, how do you see the appetite? I mean, will, uh, for instance, next quarter, do you expect your CPs to be picked up? If they are not, can you all still manage? Do you have enough bank lines? Yeah, so think that, no, again, uh, we take CP to the extent, you know, we have short-term uh, uh, assets, you know. So, of course, you know, the CP is used to fund short-term assets. Nearly 45% of our NBFC book has a maturity of less than one year, and part of that is used... Uh, is, is funded through CP. But, you know, as uh, Sunil pointed out, the thing is that, you know, this problem of uh, exposure to NBFC increasing is not only true for mutual fund, but it's also true for, you know, banks, um, where, you know, banks have, again, hit all their limits and uh, because of the fact that there is a little offtake of credit happening in other segments, manufacturing, industrial, in uh, infra, etc., and therefore, NBFCs have been the preferred mode of lending. The same is also true for um, for the mutual funds. So the thing is that what now in uh, mutual funds and banks, uh, they have always been looking at that, but probably will be more careful going ahead, is looking at the uh, ALM of uh, individual uh, NBFCs so that, you know, to make sure that people are not taking undue mismatch in their ALM hmm. and not using this uh, short-term borrowing to fund long-term assets. So that is something which, uh, of course, the borrower has to be careful. But now, in this situation, even the lender has to be careful. Okay. Sunil, what about you? What do you think the government or the uh, regulators could do now in order to sort of, you know, ease the uh, liquidity situation, especially with respect to NBFCs, mutual funds, etc.? For now, they've made some calming statements. But in terms of measures, would you expect anything? No, actually, you see, it's more about uh, making sure that there's enough liquidity in the system, right? See, basically, there are three types of risk that a credit mutual fund investor takes, right? There is uh, interest rate risk, there's default risk, and then there is the uh, market risk, right? So what happens is that, that the uh, duration risk, right, if you take an FMP, you can control the duration risk because the papers are bought exactly to that maturity. As far as the, uh, you know, the market risk is concerned, right, it happens in funds where, you know, before that time you <coughs> need to sell. Like what happened, what triggered this panic was that because of the uh, ILFS issue, a specific mutual fund sold some of the paper. And since they were willing to take a higher price on it, right, that created a panic. So I think the issue is there is liquidity in the market at a price every paper can be sold. Yes, there will be loss. But just like in equity markets, the share price correction is passed on to the investors. Mm. Debt market mutual fund investors also have got to be aware yep. that any market they sell, the, the loss or something will come to them to some extent. Yep. So I think it's an issue of liquidity and I think RBI will step in to make the liquidity window quite feasible so that there is no liquidity crunch in the economy. Okay.